St. Ignatius succeeded St. Peter Kephas as the head of the nascent community at Antioch, where the community were first named Christians. And he is close to that apostolic origin. Indeed, we talk of the apostolic fathers in his generation. They were giving us a structure, but that structure is received. The lineamenta come essentially from the apostles, and they have transmitted and not invented. The will of the Lord is perceived in certain things. In the pastoral epistles, the structure is embryonically there already. It has to be, however, unpacked. Notably, the difference between the episcopos and the presbyteros. The deacon has, from the beginning, his clear, defined role. Seven men are ordained by the apostles themselves to help that they may be free for the word and prayer. And therefore they have a material role enabling the preachers, the main columns of the church to be free for that which they are there for. And it is known that the deacons had also a liturgical role. They are presented in iconography with the dalmatic, not the chasuble, and they also hold in their hand the chalice, for from the earliest times they were ministers of the chalice. With regard to the way in which already in this very early period St. Ignatius is giving us the model of a church well structured is important for our eyes. We notice that he is writing in Greek. Greek is the language of the early church for quite a while. And after it reaches Rome takes on the Latin, and that becomes the language of the West. But there is no separation. It is the same church. One of the greatest tragedies of all time was that what was initially a quarrel in 1054 entrenched itself and spread initially from one sea, Constantinople, to others and remained that way to this day. But in the eyes of the Eternal Father, the project was to have one church, and we pray that that one day would happen again, and that obstacles to that taking place be removed. We look to the East when we want to see history fixed, for they have not been able to change, thank God. They have no way of changing things completely because they have no way of having an ecumenical council after the split from Peter. For without Peter that cannot be. But we see already in the Acts of the Apostles how the Church is able to work hand in hand with the Holy Spirit when it comes to a council. For the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles has to be thrashed out and the obligations to be placed on the Gentiles, whether they had to be also some kind of Jews, has to be sorted out. And by the help of the Holy Spirit it was serenely. And so we see the model given already there and it comes on board fairly quickly in the early church when they have to sort out one issue after another, usually doctrinal 
in the early stages. But we notice that they already have an awareness of what is a counsel in the true sense of the word. When the Holy Spirit is guiding them, it is important to be aware that there is a difference, therefore, between a group of experts, of bishops, and a council as such, that only certain are admitted as councils as such, ecumenical councils. The early councils of the undivided church are still obligatory in their consequences for us. We have been able, after the split, to have councils, for we have Peter, but they are only certain defined assemblies, well defined, and we know exactly what the conditions are. There is one borderline case, it's the Council of Ferrara, Florence, when the East and the West again were together. And we note that it was accepted by the Eastern Fathers present as an ecumenical council. And the documents coming out of there in 1439 are the last vestige of an undivided church. Unfortunately, it was not accepted by the East at grassroots levels after their return home. Nevertheless, it shows what the project was. And it shows that they too were aware of what an ecumenical council was. These ecumenical councils can claim the guidance and protection of the Holy Spirit. We notice that St. Paul VI, at the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council, which was an ecumenical council, did give the theological note indicating that it was a pastoral council and not a dogmatic one. Just for one to be clear, that the canons, therefore, of the dogmatic councils, Trent in particular, still apply and cannot be abrogated. Now, there is one thing that we need to be aware of in our day. It is that certain things which are common to East and West and received from the beginning cannot be changed and certainly cannot be tampered with by a group of experts. A synod is an accumulation of people discussing things, but they cannot claim the guidance, at least the infallible security of protection of the Holy Spirit in the same way as can an ecumenical council. And if such a group, by, as it were, some false notion of democracy, chooses to, as it were, vote in something which is not acceptable to the Christian centuries and to the East as well, tampering with the very structure of the Church in its very essence, then it is showing that the human is invading the divine, and certainly the Holy Spirit is not able to be claimed as the guide of that situation. Some assemblies in the centuries gone by were disasters and seemed to be such and could not be proclaimed ecumenical council. The Council of Baal, for instance, was such a assembly. Remember in theology hearing that, the Council of Baal n'a fait que des bêtises. The Council of Baal only did idiosities. And so it is that in our time, if we were to do something which would be totally acceptable to some only on a certain wing in the West and grossly unacceptable to those who would be aware of history and totally unacceptable to the whole Eastern Bloc, then we are showing that we have not the sensus fidelium, the sense of history or the sense of the Church itself. And also to tamper with certain things which have been placed there by centuries of spirit-guided discipline, not understanding the nature of things, for instance, in the East, is, again, a misconception. We have the serenely guided way in which 
from very early times major orders, of which the diaconate is one, and therefore can only be given to those who receive major orders, males, by divine institution, understood as such by the apostles, then if we have this situation coming in, where one can lay hands on somebody who is not able to receive it, and go out of a situation where it is not conferred on those who do not understand that from that point on there will be no other order given of the nature of matrimony, then one is in discontinuity also with the discipline. Now in the East there is from the earliest times the notion that a bishop will not be married. Should he have been married, he will not exercise his holy matrimony. And he, from the centuries that have followed, would have been taken from the non-married clergy in the East, giving the East a very good episcopacy based on the monastic life, essentially, for they would be coming from the hours of prayer and fasting of a monastery, often abbots. Therefore, a high spiritual tonus coming into that men of prayer, also aware of history and the Holy Spirit. With regard to the presbyteros in the East, there is a difference, but we forget that they have a very strict discipline in the exercise of that. They do not have courting priests. That is a big one. Therefore, they demand that in the seminary formation there be a pause before major orders, if they want a church, they must also find a presbytera, a wife, and only then will they be given a church. Therefore, it's automatic that they will be married on parish level. But the presbytera has also to have a vocation. She is not ordained but she has to abide by the ancient disciplines of the exercise of holy matrimony in the Eastern Church. Therefore, there are whole periods when matrimony cannot be used. And if the priest is about to celebrate it, they have to live in chastity the previous night. There are many things that we're not aware of in the West. And also the very name Pesbitera, and the way she dresses, is an indication of her social role. She is not just any woman, but has a very important role in the local parish and therefore has to be blameless before her marriage and has to be very much a person adequate for such an important role. We forget all these things. They have a whole spirituality which is therefore protection for the sacred. And from there come also very often the next generation of priests. That's how it works in the East. With regard to diaconate, we now, since the Second Vatican Council, do confer it on permanent deacons, but they are expected to remain unmarried should the wife die. With regard to the word diakonos, the female of that would logically be diakone, but the word diakonessa exists in the literature and is clearly not an order, a major order. There are vast quantities of literature and evidence indicating that it was never considered a major order. And the right for instituting this role was not that of conferring a major order. That was clearly understood in East and West that the order, the major order, is in three tiers. It's the same order and therefore cannot be in one part given to a non-male choice of the Lord and the choice of the Apostles themselves indicate this and an unbroken heritage in East and West which we have to respect. If we were to do something totally unacceptable to the East we would be making impossible any possible reunion with them which is very important what the Lord prayed for. One last point. The role of the deaconesses was necessary when baptism was conferred in situations involving total immersion and a certain immodesty. 
and the help given there was genuinely necessary. But one can't argue from that that therefore they should be preaching and baptizing themselves. Indeed, from the earliest times we know that it was the males who would be preaching and only those authorized to do so. St. Paul is clear on that. And if they were to try to do so, or if we were to try to lay hands upon them to make them do so, then the Lord would not follow that with his blessing. The word that they would preach would not be powerful because it would be out of a spirit of independence. And therefore the whole message given is that of independence, which is a participation in the original sin of Lucifer. We own the church and we have a democracy to make its rules. No, we receive it. The church is the mystical body and if we try to do our own thing, we will deflect graces to bring upon ourselves not benediction but further ruin. The Lord will not follow where he is not initiating.